with science. All right, so we're gonna, today we're gonna talk about the interdependence of the circulatory and the respiratory system. We talked about that before spring break started, um, but it was very apparent to me yesterday in looking at your Kahoot that you did, uh, as well as when you guys were answering questions yesterday in our lesson, that that might be something that we need to review on. So we're gonna review on that today because that is a very important uh, process and interdependence that our organ systems have in our body. So we're gonna review the circulatory and respiratory system today. And then you all will have two passages um, on your Google form. Each passage has four questions, but the passages are pretty short and they pretty much are just gonna review what we're gonna learn today. Um, so it should be a quick read. It should be a very quick assignment for you to do, but I do want you to make sure that you answer incomplete sentences. Um, I have not been seeing you all answering incomplete sentences, and that is definitely important, especially for fifth graders, almost sixth graders. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. We're gonna watch your video together, and then we will discuss it. There we are. Hopefully internet works well today and we don't have any crazy issues. Um, let me minimize this here. All right. And remember your microphones are muted because it will cut out the volume of the video. All members of the Kingdom Animalia need oxygen to make energy. Oxygen is compulsory. Without oxygen, we die. But as you know, the byproduct of the process that keeps us all alive, cellular respiration, is carbon dioxide, or CO2, and it doesn't do our bodies a bit of good. So not only do we need to take in the oxygen, we also got to get rid of the CO2. And that's why we have the respiratory and circulatory systems to bring in oxygen from the air with our lungs, circulate it to all of our cells with our heart and arteries, and collect the CO2 that we don't need with our veins and dispose of it with the lungs when we exhale. <laughs> Now, when you think of the respiratory system, the first thing that you probably think of is the lungs. But some animals can take in oxygen without lungs by a process called simple diffusion, which allows gases to move into and pass through wet membranes. For instance, arthropods have little pores all over their bodies that just sort of let oxygen wander into their body where it's absorbed by special respiratory structures. Amphibians can take in oxygen through their skin although they also have uh, their lungs or gills to help them respire because getting all your oxygen by way of diffusion takes freaking forever. So why do we have to have these stupid lung things instead of just using simple diffusion? Well, a couple of reasons. For starter, the bigger the animal, the more oxygen it needs, and a lot of mammals are pretty big. So we have to actively force air into our lungs in order to get enough oxygen to run our bodies. Also, mammals and birds are warm-blooded, which means that they have to regulate their body temperatures, and that takes many, many calories, and burning those calories requires lots of oxygen. Finally, in order for oxygen to pass through a membrane, the membrane has to be wet. So for a newt to take oxygen in through its skin, the skin has to be moist all the time, which, you know, for a newt isn't a big deal, but, you know, I don't particularly want to be constantly moist. Do you? Fish need oxygen too, of course, but they absorb oxygen that's already dissolved in the water through their gills. If you've ever seen a fish gill, you'll remember that they're just sort of a bunch of filaments of tissue layered together. This gill tissue extracts dissolved oxygen and excretes the carbon dioxide. Still, there are some fish that have lungs, like lungfish, which we call lungfish because they have lungs. And that's actually where lungs first appeared in the animal kingdom. All animals from reptiles on up respire with lungs deep in their bodies, basically right behind the heart. So while us more complex animals can't use diffusion to get oxygen directly, our lungs can. Lungs are chock full of oxygen dissolving membranes that are kept moist with mucus. Moist with mucus, another great band name. The key to these bad boys is that lungs have a ton of surface area so they can absorb a lot of oxygen at once. You wouldn't know from looking at them, but human lungs contain about 75 square meters of oxygen dissolving membrane. 
that's bigger than the roof of my house. And the simple diffusion that your lungs use is pretty freaking simple. You and I breathe oxygen in through our nose and mouth. It passes down a pipe called your larynx, which then splits off from your esophagus and turns into your trachea, which then branches to form two bronchi, one of which goes into each lung. These bronchi branch off again, forming narrower and narrower tubes called bronchioles. These bronchioles eventually end in tiny sacs called alveoli. Each alveolus is about a fifth of a millimeter in diameter, but each of us has about 300 million of them. And this, friends, is where the magic happens. Alveoli are little bags of thin, moist membranes, and they're totally covered in tiny, narrow blood-carrying capillaries. Oxygen dissolves through the membrane and is absorbed by the blood in these capillaries, which then goes off through the circulatory system to make cells all over your body happy and healthy. But while the alveoli are handing over the oxygen, the capillaries are switching it out for carbon dioxide that the circulatory system just picked up from all over the body. So the alveoli and capillaries basically just swap one gas for another. From there, the alveoli takes that CO2 and squeezes it out through the bronchioles, the bronchi, the trachea, finally out of your nose and or mouth. So inhale for me once. Congratulations, oxygen is now in your bloodstream. Now exhale. Wonderful, the CO2 has now left the building and you don't even have to think about it so you could think about something more important, like how many Cheetos you could realistically fit into your mouth at the same time. So now you're all, yeah, that's great, Hank, but how do lungs actually like work? Like how do they do the thing where they do, where they get moved to come in and out and stuff? Well, eloquent question, well asked. Lungs work like a pump, but they don't actually have any muscles in them that cause them to contract and expand. For that, we have this big flat layer of muscles that sits right underneath the lungs called the thoracic diaphragm. At the end of an exhalation, your diaphragm is relaxed. So picture an arc pushing up on the bottom of your lungs and crowding them out so that they don't have very much volume. But when you breathe in, the diaphragm contracts and flattens out, allowing the lungs to open up. And as we know from physics, as the volume of a container grows larger, the pressure inside it goes down. And the fluids, including air, always flow down their pressure gradient from high pressure to low pressure. So as the pressure in our lungs goes down, air flows into them. When the diaphragm relaxes, the pressure inside the lungs becomes higher than the air outside, and the deoxygenated air rushes out. And that is breathing. Now, it just so happens that the circulatory system works on a pumping mechanism just like the respiratory system, except instead of moving air into and out of the lungs, it moves blood into and out of the lungs. The circulatory system moves oxygenated blood out of the lungs to the places in your body that needs it, and then brings the deoxygenated blood back to your lungs. And maybe you're thinking, well, what about the heart? Isn't the heart the whole point of the circulatory system? Well, settle down going to explain. We're used to talking about the heart as the head honcho of the circulatory system, and yeah, you would be in serious trouble if you didn't have a heart. But the heart's job is to basically power the circulatory system, move the blood all around your body, and get it back to the lungs so that it can pick up more oxygen and get rid of the CO2. As a result, the circulatory system of mammals essentially makes a figure eight. Oxygenated blood is pumped from the heart to the rest of the body, and then when it makes its way back to the heart again, it's then pumped on a shorter circuit to the lungs to pick up more oxygen and unload CO2 before it goes back to the heart and starts the whole cycle over again. So even though the heart does all the heavy lifting in the circulatory system, the lungs are the home base for the red blood cells, the postal workers that carry the oxygen and the CO2. Now the way that your circulatory system moves the blood around is pretty nifty. Remember when I was talking about air moving from high pressure to low pressure? Well, so does blood. A four-chambered heart, which is just one big honking beast of muscle, is set up so that one chamber, the left ventricle, has very high pressure. In fact, the reason it seems like the heart is situated a little bit to the left of center is because the left ventricle is so freaking enormous and muscly. It has to be that way in order to keep the pressure high enough that the oxygenated blood will get out of there. From the left ventricle, the blood moves through the aorta, giant tube, and then through the arteries, blood vessels that carry the blood away from the heart to the rest of the body. Arteries are muscular and thick-walled to maintain high pressure as the blood travels along. As arteries branch off to go to different places, they form smaller arterioles, and finally, the very little capillary beds, which 
through their huge surface area facilitate the delivery of oxygen to all of the cells in the body that need it. Now the capillary beds are also where the blood picks up CO2. So from there, the blood keeps moving down the pressure gradient through a series of veins. These do the opposite of what the arteries did. Instead of splitting off from each other to become smaller and smaller, little ones flow together to make bigger and bigger veins to carry the deoxygenated blood back to the heart. The big difference between most veins and most arteries is that instead of being thick walled and squeezy, veins have thinner walls and have valves that keep the blood from flowing backwards, which would be bad. This is necessary because the pressure in the circulatory system keeps dropping lower and lower until the blood flows into two major veins. The first is the inferior vena cava, which runs pretty much down the center of the body and handles blood coming from the lower part of your body. And the second is the superior vena cava, which sits on top of the heart and collects the blood from the upper body. Together, they run into the right atrium of the heart, which is the point of the lowest pressure in the circulatory system. So all this deoxygenated blood is now back in the heart and it needs to sop up some more oxygen. So it flows into the right ventricle and then into the pulmonary artery. Now arteries, remember, flow away from the heart, even though in this case it contains the oxygenated blood. And pulmonary means of the lungs. So you know that this is the path to the lungs. After the blood makes its way to the alveoli and picks up some fresh oxygen, it flows to the pulmonary vein. Remember, it's a vein because it's flowing to the heart, even though it contains oxygenated blood. And from there, it enters the heart again, where it flows into the left atrium, and then into the left ventricle, where it does the whole body circuit again and again and again and again. And that is the way that we work. Our hearts are really efficient and awesome, and they have to be because we're endotherms, or warm-blooded, meaning that we maintain a steady internal temperature. Having an endothermic metabolism is really great because you're less vulnerable to fluctuations in external temperature than ectotherms or cold-blooded animals. Also, the enzymes that do all the work in our bodies operate over a very narrow range of temperatures. In humans, that range is between 36 and 37 degrees Celsius. So the trade-off is that endotherms need to eat constantly to maintain our high metabolisms and also create heat. And for that, we need a lot of oxygen, hence the amazing efficient four-chambered heart and our gigantic fracking lungs. Ectotherms, on the other hand, have slow metabolisms and don't need as much in the way of food. A snake is totally pumped if it gets a meal once a month. So since ectotherms aren't doing much in the way of metabolizing, they don't need much in the way of oxygen. So their circulatory systems can be, you know, a little bit janky and inefficient. It's still cool. Remember back when we were tracking the development of chordates? One of the Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop it there because then he just kind of goes on this random scientific uh, just spillage, if you will. Um, and that's not really as important as what I want you all to take from the video today. So as um, he talked about in the video, I'm trying to go back to our chart. Um, which we don't really need that. So I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna stop sharing our screen for right now so that I can see you all and you can see me. Um, so what the video was talking about, and, and uh, Riley, I know you had a question, so I'm gonna come back to you here in just a second. Um, but the most important thing to take from this is that within science, and I'm sure you guys have picked up on it, science is full of cycles. We've got the water cycle, we've got the life cycle, we have our ecosystem food chains and, and the flow of energy, which is a cycle, it keeps going and going. Um, and the same thing happens within our bodies. Um, we have our circulatory system, which helps to circulate oxygenated and deoxygenated blood but it can't circulate, it can't transport that blood throughout our bodies without the respiratory system. And yes, remember that the circulatory system, that's the transport system in our body. That helps get the oxygen and nutrients spread throughout our whole body. Um, but oxygen is the most important because think about it. If we had to, Believe it or not, we could go a day or two without eating. Um, we don't have to constantly re replenish the nutrients in our blood. However, you can't go a day or two without breathing, right? So that's why the respiratory system is so important. Um, just minutes without breathing, 10 minutes is, is devastating, um, can cause brain damage. 
um, and, and even death. So uh, the respiratory system is extremely important, but without the circulatory system to carry that oxygenated blood around our bodies, then the respiratory system kind of can't uh, serve its purpose either. Um, hmm. So somebody tell me what is the, oh wait, actually Riley, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. So this is my question. Um, my question was, what was the membrane? Okay, a membrane is an outer protective layer. Okay, so like our cells have membranes. Um, your skin is actually a, a, a membrane organism that protects the rest of your body. Okay. So it's sort of like an outer layer for our skull, so it's like... The skeleton is our, like, like, so the skeleton's like our body and, like, our skin's like an armor, sort of like that? Yes, absolutely. Kind of like uh, a water balloon. When you fill a balloon with water, the membrane protects that water. And what happens when you rupture the membrane, then the water explodes and it goes everywhere. Um, so it's kind of like, it can, you're right, it's the protective barrier, but it also kind of keeps everything in its place. Well. And I wanted to tell this to the class, but some warm-blooded animals, like some warm-blooded animals, such as like the megalodon, they went out and hunted in like the cold waters and like sharks. So a bunch of different kinds of sharks has like, um, like they can heat their body up to like stand to like basically just swim out in the Antarctica like they're swimming in Hawaii because their um, body warmth is that good to where they to where they don't feel much cold and the megalodon was massive so it had a massive like thing to warm its body up for hunting in the Arctic in the Antarctica. Oh wow that's really cool so that discussion at the end that he was having kind of made you think about that when he was talking about the warm and cold-blooded animals. Yeah because we're not we are on um, like we can't warm ourselves to where we can swim in Antarctica and feel like we're in like a hot tub. We don't have that kind of like body heat. We have like the body heat to like last, like we can like go out in winter. The winter is mostly where our body heat can help us with, but in Antarctica, uh, it's just too cold for the for our body heat to keep it. And like penguins and polar bears, they like adapted to the cold, but like sharks, they have, like strong, like they have strong, um, warm blood. Okay. Hmm. That is really cool. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, but we do, we do got to stay focused because I do want you guys to finish by nine thirty, so you have time to finish your science assignment before we have family time today. Okay. Thank you, Riley. All right. Um. So so, I think that's about it. Does anybody have any questions? Did that help clear up some of the misconceptions from yesterday? Connor, you have a question? Okay, no. go ahead. Um, I don't, I didn't get the point where he was talking about how snakes only have to eat once a month. I have, I have a python and it's not eating its food. Well, and, and that was just for some snakes. That's kind of why I stopped the video there because we started talking about other organisms and uh, that's not really as important. Um, but like I told you guys, uh, snakes are the same way. Snake can't survive if it doesn't breathe. However, it doesn't have to eat every day. Um, and vice versa it goes the same way for us we don't have to eat every day although it's very helpful Alora, you are sleepy girl good morning i'm glad you're here um but if the snake doesn't breathe and if we don't breathe even for just minutes then that is very catastrophic for 
our body for the organism as a whole. Um, anybody else? Questions, statements, aha moments, something that makes sense now? Anybody? Okay, Connor shaking his head. It makes a little bit more sense now. So uh, one of you, oh, I see the thumbs up. Thank you. So one of you uh, tell me, what is the purpose of the blood? Unmute your mic and tell me. The reason that we have blood is so we can, so we can like, um, so we will be able to use our heart and our veins. Okay. Our pump our heart, and without our heart pumping, we die. Okay. Somebody add on to what. Connor said because it wasn't and remember our lesson wasn't mainly about the heart it's mainly about the blood the blood like I was saying earlier the how your body heats up your blood heats up because your blood goes through your entire body and it goes through all the parts of your body and the blood can oh, can the blood can heat that up and protect you from some like cold stuff Okay, yes, but what is the purpose of the blood? Somebody else. KJ, I see you're unmuted. Tell me. Um, it's like the blood brings oxygen to us. Yes, blood transports oxygen throughout the rest of the body, but the blood also transports something else. What is it? Oxygen. Oxygen. There's something else. Nutrients. Nutrients. Yes, the blood transports oxygen and nutrients throughout our body. All right. Um, so what I'm going to do, guys, is um, I'm going to link your assignment for science in the chat box. So that way you can just, like, click it and answer it before you go to family time. It's all right here. You don't even have to go back to the agenda. Um, I do want to tell you something though, until I go back and I read your response and I grade it, it's going to mark your response as wrong. So don't like freak out, go back and, and check your score again. I don't know after lunchtime or something. Okay. So don't freak out if it marks them wrong. I'm telling you that it's going to do that by default. And remember, I am not going to give you full credit if my fifth graders do not write in complete sentences. That means a capital letter at the beginning, punctuation at the end, and a complete thought in the middle. Okay? If you can use text evidence, most of the answers can be found directly in the text. But we talked about it today, too. So if you can just remember, that's fine. But remember, I really like for you to prove your answer using evidence from the text. So there is the form and I'm going to stay online here on Zoom. So if you guys just want to keep Zoom in the background, that, that'll be fine. I'll let you guys know when I'm going to leave. However, um, Tiana and Emily, if you are here, I don't see Emily, but I did see Tiana earlier. Tiana, if you can um, hop off and go meet with Miss McLean real quick, she has a quick little reading lesson uh, that she wants to do with you. And then um, if you have any questions or anything, you can come back over. Okay? Okay. All right. Bye, darling. Bye. All right. The assignment's not a link. What? The